All right, welcome everybody to our second live session for DES 242, Logo and Identity Design. I wanna thank everyone for being able to make it on a Thursday. I know it's a little bit later than usual. However, Tuesday was Halloween and I figured people might be going out trick-or-treating or bringing their kids trick-or-treating or having their doorbell ring a million times. And then Wednesday we have, um, of week one is design club. So I believe it's design club. Um, it's either design club or coffee with creatives. They alternate weeks. So I didn't want to have our, it was design club. I didn't want to have our live session during that because I want to make sure that you guys are free to be able to go to design club or coffee with creatives. So here we are on Thursday night. Like I said, a little bit later than I would like to host a live session, but, um, you know, it is what it is on this week. And this this should only happen this week, which is good. So our agenda for tonight, I'll go over some announcements. We're going to take a field trip into the library. We're going to talk about some top mistakes in logo design. We're going to talk about one of my favorite logo designers, Paul Rand. And then we're also going to be talking about redesigning an icon. So little... And I'll, I'll give, um, I'll give my, my thoughts on that as well. I, I have many opinions on this. Um, so just a reminder, um, my telephone hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time. But the best way to get in touch with me is via email. And just a reminder that I am located at Eastern Standard Time. So just be aware of that time zone change when you are trying to reach me. And sometimes I might not be able to get back to you until the next day. I do teach at another school as well. So so I try to check my emails as, as often as I can. Um, and hi, Seltzer Shows. Glad you're able to make it tonight. You're, you haven't missed anything yet. <laughs> Um, so just a reminder about our due dates, all assignments and assessments are due by Saturday for full credit. Um, communication is key. If you are going to have any late work, please let me know. This will definitely save you some missed points. Um, week four assignments cannot be turned in late. The class will turn into a pumpkin and it will lock you out. And I'll, I'll remind you of that many times during week four. Also, your original discussion posts are due by Wednesday and you need to also to respond to two of your fellow students by Saturday. If you are late um, at this point, please make sure you're getting that discussion post in because I will not accept late posts past the Saturday deadline for the week um, because we've all moved on to the next topic and the whole point of the discussion is to be in there and talking amongst each other on the topic of the week. Um, again, our core schedule is our live sessions are Monday and Tuesday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mountain Time. This gives you ample time during the week to get those assignments done. And we will go back to our regularly scheduled program next week. If you do need any outside help, the Student Success Center is open with tutoring available and there is no appointment necessary. All right, so let's take a look at some of our announcements. That I posted. Um, there was an announcement for Design Club, but that was yesterday. So um, Design Club is on weeks one and three. So if you are available and you want to pop in, it's really cool. Um, I definitely um, suggest this. And then on week two is Coffee with Creative. So we, we do something... Um, the first three weeks on Wednesday nights. So if you can try to pop over there and, um, you know, and see what the topic of the week is, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I ended up, um, checking out on my cell phone because I couldn't put it on my iPad. Um, that Adobe Photoshop sketch app, and it's pretty cool. Um, it's a little bit weird to use, I'm not gonna lie, on the iPhone screen. I have an iPhone 6, so it's not like I have a really small screen, but it's obviously not as big as my tablet. And you just can draw with your hand, um, well, with your finger, um, or a stylus if you have it. But there's actually a lot of options on there that I didn't realize there would be. And there's even an Adobe Illustrator sketch program as well. I didn't download that one, but um, when you're logging in, if you do put this program on either your, um, your tablet or your phone, make sure that you log in with the same um, email 
that you have for your creative suite and then you can sync everything, which is really cool. Um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, this, this program is pretty cool. Um, like I said, I, I just put it on my cell phone real quick, but, um, it was, it was pretty interesting to use. I'm going to see if I can pull it up for you guys. Sometimes when I try to show things on the screen on my cell phone, it looks a little bit weird, but let me see if I can pull it up. Um, let me close that out. Hold on a second. Do, do, do. So I can kind of, yes, no. Oh, you're not going to be able to see. That's a bummer. But what it does is it tells you, do you want to start a new sketch? It's kind of a light screen, so that's probably why I can't see it. There's a little bit of a glare. Um, on, and it gives you like a couple of options. It's like iPad, letter, and small postcard. And I'm on my iPhone, so I'm like, do I pick iPad or do I pick letter? So I picked letter last time, which was great. Um, and now you might be able, I feel like if I turn it a certain way. Oh, maybe like that. You can see like that there's some options. There's different options for different tools that you can customize. So it's pretty cool, you know, if you want to check it out. Um, and you just sketch with your finger. So, I mean, you know, just one of those, um, <laughs> the way mine is right now, it's kind of running like that. I have an iPhone 6 and um, I turned, it, it kind of crashed today, and then, so I restarted it, and all of my photos were gone. I almost had a heart attack, but luckily I paid for the cloud um, service, and they were still there, but my phone is literally chugging along, trying to download 7,000 photos back to my phone. Oh, what a nightmare. So, yeah, talk about phones. Ah, technology. <laughs> so while we're down here, I'm sure my battery's probably gonna die. That's also probably why it wasn't loading that program properly. It's like, I'm doing something right now. I'm trying to download. You took 8,000 photos of the dog and I'm trying to download them. So yeah, good times. Good times with technology. That's, that's what I like to say. All right, so. Let's take a visual look and then I'll actually show you in the actual screen, but we're going to take a little trip through the library. Um, I made a couple of slides so that way when I share my slides in the announcements, if you don't remember how to get to where we were, I kind of have a visual tour going on here. So we're going to start with the library tab right on our homepage. Then we're going to go to ProQuest, not the ProQuest, the ProQuest newsstand, but just a regular ProQuest um, link. The ProQuest newsstand doesn't really work um, very well. It's really hard to find articles. I find so much more when you just go into the main ProQuest link. Then you will do a search right here in the lovely search bar. Um, for logo redesign, and then you can see all of the different topics that come up. So I'm going to go over here to our course, and I'll I'll do that for you guys. So we're going to go to library first, and you'll see this is where it gets a little bit confusing because you have two different ProQuest links right here. So um, use the first one, and then you just I just do a basic search. So we were told to do a search for logo redesign and hit enter and you can see that there is um a whole bunch of articles 3055 um yeah ProQuest is great for writing papers which is what this is for this is in um reference to our assessment for this week so i'll pull up the assessment at the same time which is on gauging logo redesign reactions. So you need to choose three different articles to read and analyze for this assignment. So let me read over the full assignment and then we'll get back into the library. Um, because I didn't, I didn't really get too in depth into this in the first live session. So when a company undertakes a logo redesign, which is what you're going to be doing this week in your assignment, they must also consider how to manage the audience's reaction to what is created. 
Often consumers develop deep emotional ties to the look and even feel a sense of community and ownership of the company. Because feelings can run high when a company undertakes a logo redesign, the general public may or may not feel betrayed by the idea that something about the visual presentation has been changed. Um, companies often must present a clear research strategy when, the, when they present their newly redesigned logo so that everyone understands the thinking and reasoning behind the redesign. Often companies present answers around the following questions when showing their newly redesigned logo. Number one, why was the logo redesigned? Two, how does the new design represent new directions for the company? Three, how does the new design still embrace, legacy, embrace the legacy the company has been built upon? So for our prompt in this assessment, we will conduct a library, some library research to understand how companies have either successfully or unsuccessfully presented their newly redesigned logos to the general public. So first, click on the Independence University Library link, which I did on the homepage. Next, it says select the ProQuest newsstand link. I find that you are not going to find what you are looking for under that link. So select just the regular ProQuest one. I mean, we can do it both ways if you want after this, but I'll kind of show you. Um, this will allow you to search a database of over 1,500 electronic articles. Then type the words logo redesign into the search box. This search should reveal several thousand articles about logo redesigns. Clicking on an article's name will reveal the article so you can read it. Choose three different articles to read and analyze for this assignment. So for each article, you will need to write at least 150 words summarizing the following. Why was the logo redesigned? What new direction does the logo represent? What was the general public's reaction to the logo? Do you think it was a successful redesign? That's your opinion. If so, why? And if not, what would you have done differently to make it better? In addition, take a screenshot of both the before and after of each logo. If there are no images in the article, you may have to conduct a Google search to retrieve before and after versions of the logo. So remember in my um, slideshow on Monday, I showed you a couple of before and after versions of um, a couple of logos. So you'll need to do the same thing. Place both your text and images into an InDesign document for your final presentation. You should have a minimum of 450 words, and you must also include APA citations for each article provided. When you have completed all parts of the assessment, save your work as a multi-page PDF with the following name, you know, DES242, Assessment 1, First, Last PDF. Um, here's the thing. I would personally type out your your 450 words in Microsoft Word, and then copy them into InDesign. If you want to do your whole project in Microsoft Word and then save it as a PDF, because you can place images if you want in Microsoft Word, um, that's fine. I'm, I'm completely fine with that because Word is, Word is going to catch your spelling and your grammatical errors for you. Um, you can do a spell check, obviously, in InDesign, but I, InDesign really isn't going to catch and underline those grammatical errors. So I'm leaving it up to you. I just want you to present, you know, the best um, assessment possible basically. So if you feel that you can make it look very professional in Word the same way that you would in InDesign, I'm okay if you use Word. Just make sure you save and upload the PDF to meet that requirement. If you want to type it out in Word and then copy and paste that text into InDesign so that way you can give it a little bit more of a design, I say have at it. Um, either way will be fine with me. Um, just make sure that you meet all of the requirements for the assessment. And if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed um, researching ProQuest, here's a video that shows you how to use ProQuest and other library resources right here. But um, I just wanted to kind of go in and show you some of the articles. And I'll also go in and show you the other one, the newsstand. I just feel like I ne nothing ever comes up for me. And yeah, newsstand does not seem to be working right now. So there you go. <laughs> use, use regular ProQuest. Um, it's completely fine. It looks like there's a, 
an, an error probably in the database. That's what this looks like. So good times. All right. Um, so here's a couple of articles. There's one on um, Google getting a new redesign, which doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, detail with it. Um, then there is, there was a couple of good ones. Here's one on Buick about them possibly redesigning their logo. Here's one on a corporate makeover. Um, Yahoo's new logo. Oh, there's a good one. Starbucks effect. Committed customers don't like the logo redesign. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of good articles on here on a lot of um, logos that you're probably familiar with. And Procrest can sometimes look like a scanned newspaper. <laughs> These things happen. Um, and you can, oh, this one has at least some images that go along with it. So you have a couple of visuals. Um, here's on Yahoo. So you can look up, um, basically, this was from 2013. So you can look up the new logo and the old logo. And then here's um, about Starbucks from 2011. So I would try to find something kind of recent, if you can. You know, at least in the 2000s, I'd be fine with that. Um, but you know, if there's like, a, if there's a logo that you know was redesigned, um, try to look it up. Like, uh, let me see if I can find something on the UPS logo. No, thanks. Here it is. Um, UPS rebrands overnight. Mm, that doesn't really talk about the logo itself. Modifies logo to reflect expansion. Not a lot of information there either. Um, oh, here we go. UPS unveils new look. So again, yeah, if you find something and there's only a couple of words, you obviously can't write 150 words on it. So you're going to want to find a full article. Um, You can even enter a date range. Like I know, I believe the UPS article was, uh, UPS article, the UPS logo was updated in 2003, so I can start and end in 2003. There we go. This feels like it might be a full article. Yes, all right. <laughs> and designers are going postal over UPS's $20 million corporate identity relaunch. Um, this is, I remember when this happened and I get into this a little bit. So 150 words for each of the three different logos. So it's going to be 450 words total. So you'll look up three different logo redesigns and write 150 words on each logo redesign for a total of 450 words. Yeah, yeah. Yep, so, and some of them might even have the full text PDF, um, which is great because then you can see the actual article from wherever it was, which is pretty cool. And you can download that PDF. Um, and don't just copy and paste. No, it's really not. I mean, 150 words is what, like a paragraph? It's pretty much your, you have a, a paragraph each. So it gives you a lot of room to really design the eight and a half by 11 page. You know, if you're doing it in InDesign, you really can like, you know, you can make it look like an article on logo rebranding, you know, like get creative with it, have fun with this assignment. That's what, you know, you're doing a lot, you know, some writing and some research, but have fun with it when you're done, you know, design the page. You, it could be, it could end up being a portfolio piece. I had to create, um, back when I was in school, a whole bunch of stamps using logos 
Um, and I actually did my project on Paul Rand, and I don't even know if I still have it, but I did stamps based on the logos that he had designed. So I, I kind of made it, you know, I had fun with it. I made it pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so, you know, you can look up, like I said, you can look up something specific, you know, the Google logo was redesigned. Um, I don't remember what year that was. I want to say maybe 2011, whoops. So you can look up that. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot like, um, you can look up, you know, just the Starbucks logo. I'm trying to think of logos that were redesigned kind of recently. Starbucks, Google, UPS, um, Yahoo, um, the Airbnb logo. Oh, the Walmart logo. Yep. The Walmart logo was redesigned recently. Um, what else? The big ones. You know, it's another one. It's not so much that's been redesigned recently, but there is definitely a history behind the redesign of it is the NBC logo with the peacock feathers. You know, that's gone through a lot of different revisions over the years. So that could be really interesting. The U.S. the U.S. Postal Service. Let's go um, logo over the years. The Apple logo has been redesigned a couple of times. Yep, that has been. Um, that's right. This is the old version of it, and here's the new version of it. You are right. I should have known that. My father-in-law was a postman, and his um, his old shirts have the old logo on them. Um, let me think what else. What are some other good logo redesigns that have happened recently? Um, the U.S. Army, I think that one did have a logo redesign. And I don't think the Navy has, or the Air Force. Um, what else? I'm thinking of some like big companies. So Apple was one, Google, Yahoo, UPS, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts did. Um, Shell did, it's not a big redesign, but Shell Oil did have a redesign. Um, they kind of, they, it just went down to being just a Shell. ExxonMobil did too. Um, I feel like they both happened kind of at the same time. Everybody started to up, update their look. And I'm trying to think if BP did after the big BP disaster. They might have had a redesign to kind of fix their corporate identity. Um, I think Home Depot did, but I don't think it was a huge redesign. And let me think of some other stores. J.C. Penney had a big logo redesign. So there's, there's a lot of them out there. It's really interesting. You know, it's, it's almost like, you know, we got into the 2000s, 2010s, and all of the companies were like, well, it's a, it's a new decade, so let's, let's redesign our logos. <laughs> so that's how you will use um, ProQuest. Like I said, ProQuest newsstand not working, clearly. So use regular ProQuest, and um, you should have no trouble finding tons of articles, 3,050 of them, to, um, to pick from to do your project. Right, you can, you can, yeah, or just Google change logos. Exactly, good, good tip. All right, so let's take a look at some common mistakes when it comes to logo redesigns because that's what we're doing this week. So mistake number one, relying on trends. There's always a trend in graphic design, um, and we all fall into it. You know, the trend right now is to do waves in the background. The trend is to do a pattern in the background. And 10 years from now, we're going to look at everything we've done to have these nice, subtle patterns in the background, and we're going to go, oh, 
that's so 2017. <laughs> so try not to rely on trends so much, especially when you are doing a logo. Because, you know, if you focus on the current logo trend, you're pretty much putting a sell-by date on your logo and you want a logo to last. Um, so trends, whether they're swooshes, glows, or bevels, glows and bevels should not, drop shadows should not be on a logo. I'm just gonna throw that out there right now because they will never reproduce correctly um, in a vector setting. So do not use glows or bevels and don't use a swoosh if, you know, because all anyone thinks of is Nike. You know, those come and go and ultimately they end up turning into cliches. A well-designed logo should be timeless and this can be achieved by ignoring the latest design tricks and gimmicks. The biggest cliche in logo design is the dreaded corporate swoosh, which is the ultimate way to play it safe. As a logo designer, your job is to create a unique identity for your client, so completely ignoring logo design trends is the best. You know, be your own trend. That's that's what I say. And it's hard because sometimes when you see something, it's hard to unsee it. You know, that's why when I do um, examples and I do demos, I try not to do a demo of exactly what your assignment is because subconsciously you're like, I don't know how to unsee that and not design it the same way. You know, while I just watch that happen, like I'm, I'm just drawn to putting the photo in the upper left hand corner because I can't unsee putting the photo in the upper left hand corner. So it's really difficult, you know, to, um, to unsee things in a way. <laughs> Use raster images. So this is, this is Logo Design 101. Um, an example of how raf, raster graphics can um, limit reproduction is visible right here. As you can see, it gets all pixelated. Um, you want to use vector graphics all the time. So that means using Illustrator and not Photoshop because Photoshop will give you a raster image and Illustrator will give you vector. So I should not see any logos that come over as a JPEG or were created in Photoshop. You cannot create a logo in Photoshop. Um, so using raster images for logos is not advisable because it can cause problems with reproduction. While Photoshop is capable of creating very large logos, you never know for sure how large a logo you will have to reproduce at some point. So if you might create it at 10 by 10, but guess what? 10 inches by 10 inches and be like, what is it ever going to be big? Why would it ever be bigger? And then your company buys a billboard and it's definitely gonna be bigger. So you must always have vector art for your logo. Containing stock art. Don't use stock art in your logo. Um, it can definitely put your client at risk. And this mistake is often made by business owners who design their own logo and really don't know any better, or by amateur designers who are not clued into the laws on copyright. So downloading stock vector imagery from websites such as vector stock is not a crime, but it could possibly get you into trouble if you incorporate it into a logo because it is not, it's not meant to be used that way. And there's often copyright attached to that artwork stating that it can't be used that way. It, it, right. And you know what? Ultimately, it is just lazy. You know, you are a designer. Draw your art, you know, and if you, and if you can't draw it, then stick to something, you know, stick to text. I know that I am not really good at drawing things in Illustrator. Like my husband is awesome at drawing things in Illustrator. You know, I mean, he, if I ever, I could show you some of his work and it is crazy. He is an awesome illustrator. Me, not so much. It's not my, it's not my strong suit, honestly. Like typography is more my strong suit. So when it comes to logo design, if they want a strong typographic logo, I'm your girl. If they need something custom drawn out, I get my husband involved. I, I know my limits as a designer. And I know my limits in my in different programs, you know, so if you can't draw You know the image that you need drawn stick to a typographic logo. There's nothing wrong with the logo being completely typographic Designing for yourself rather rather than your client so you never want to impose your own personality onto a client's work so if I say 
you know, I just don't feel that this logo has the right feeling for this client. And you respond, but I really like it. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm just being blunt here. It really doesn't matter if you like it. Ultimately, the client needs to like it and it needs to work for the client. So if you are drawing or, or creating a logo because you think it's cool and that's it, it has your own personality and it's you're imposing that on your client's work. So even though you found a cool new font and you can't wait to use it in a design, don't. When it comes to a logo, don't. Ask yourself if that font is really appropriate for the business that you're designing for. So for example, a modern typographic font that you just love is probably not suited to a serious business such as a lawyer's office. You know, if you saw a logo for a lawyer that looked like this, chances are good you're not going to visit that lawyer because number one, you can barely read his name, but number two, it just... It doesn't have the feel of a law office. It, they don't seem like they're really, you know, legit. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that they would win a case for me. Exactly, and that's going to be my thoughts. You know what? I, there was a time where I wouldn't go into certain stores if I did not like their logo. I mean, I was such a font snob that if they picked a font that I absolutely hated, I would not go in their store just because I was like, oh, I cannot stand that font. And they picked such a bad font. There's no way there's going to be anything in that story I'm going to like. And people thought I was crazy, but like, seriously, like that's how much of a font snob I used to be. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it, it, hey, there are people out there like me. So <laughs> keep that in mind when you are designing something. And if you're wondering what the font was, the font is review, and I will not go into your store if you have that as a font. Do not have an overly complex logo. This is where I have trouble. I, you know what? We all have our Achilles heel when it comes to graphic design or logo design, and my Achilles heel, my kryptonite, is getting too complex and not knowing where to stop. So a highly detailed design will not scale well when it's printed or viewed in a smaller size. So, you know, you got to think about that when you're doing these designs. Is this so complex that if I made it one inch by one inch, you wouldn't be able to see what's going on in the logo? You got to think about that. And if you're not sure, make it one inch by one inch and step away from the computer and see if you can still see the name of the company and get an idea of what the company is at that size. That'll let you know if you've made your logo too complex. So when printed in small size, a uh, complex design will lose detail and in some cases will look like a smudge or even worse, a mistake. The more detail a logo has, the more information the viewer has to process. A logo should be memorable and one of the best ways to make it memorable is to keep things simple. So some people, and I've noticed this in the past, um, will put you know, a little registered mark or a little trademark. And when their logo gets super small, it looks like an extra dot of ink that is accidentally there. And then I've, I've like really zoomed in. I'm like, oh, it's a trademark sign. And I'm like, well, clearly that doesn't work. And we all know your logo is trademarked. But like, do you really need to put a trademark sign? It seems a little redundant. A logo that relies on color for its effect. So a logo should work well in grayscale. So if you have two colors, see how similar these colors are to each other, that when they are turned to just grayscale, that they become the same exact color because their hue is so similar. It's not going to work if somebody not paying attention just turns your logo to black and white. And that's exactly how this happens, is they turn your logo, they just go file, you know, edit, convert, black and white. So you want to make sure that your logo works in black and white. And that's why we always design logos first in black and white. So that way we're sure that they work. And this is actually a really common mistake. You know, some designers really can't wait to add color to a design. And they sometimes end up relying on that color completely. So choosing color should always be your last decision. So start your work at black and white.
and then a poor choice of fonts. Again, font choice can make or break a logo. When it comes to executing a logo, choosing the right font is the most important decision a designer can make. More often than not, a logo fails because of poor, poor font choices. Our example right here has Comic Sans. I should never see Comic Sans in a logo. I should never see all capitalized script in a logo. There are so many fun. I shouldn't see brush script in a logo. Do I know why? Because there are so many other different, better choices than brush script if you need a script font. And you may think I'm being mean, but these are really basic fonts and you're creating a logo here. So you want to step outside of your comfort zone and really do some research on fonts that work. Like, you know, stop and think about what it is you are designing. You know, what's the feel of this piece? Um, you know, these are all of the, the questions you should be asking yourself. Um, right, right. I hate that too. When you see like a really great font, but then you realize it only comes in all caps and you're like, oh, well, that's not going to work. There's a, um, there's a serif font. I think it's called Casteller. Casteller. I'm probably saying it wrong, but it only comes in all caps. And every single time I'm like, oh, that'll work. And I'm like, crap, that comes only in all caps. It, it gets me every single time. Um, if your design has too many fonts, um, as you can see, this version right here, way too many fonts. Um, a logo works best with a maximum of two fonts. So using too many fonts is trying, like trying to show someone all the photos in your photo album at once. Each typeface is different and the viewer needs time to recognize it. So when you see too many at once, it'll definitely end up causing confusion and your eyes are just like, I don't know what I'm looking at. So use a maximum of two fonts and of different weights. That's the standard practice. And then if your logo copies others, and these are actual logos, and look at how close they are to each other. The, the best is the Los Angeles Lakers and the Los Angeles Clippers. That one kills me because I get it. Their colors are different, but like seriously, they're basically the same exact logo. Um, the Sun Microsystems and the Columbia Sportswear, very similar. Beats logo definitely... Um, stole their idea from um, 1971's that um logo. The Scottish Arts Council and Art Workers basically have the same exact logo. Carrier and Ford, very similar. And then the National Film Board, um, which is recently updated in the Virtual Global Task Force, almost the same exact logo. So, and here's the thing. Neither of the, whoops, neither of these logos have their name associated with the logo. So you can't tell me that if, you know, I didn't give you the name right here, that you would know which one was which. The, it, it, seriously. And you probably can't tell me if I didn't give you the name, which one is the Beats logo or is this the Beats logo also just in a different color? <laughs> so, you know, it's definitely something, you know, copying does not do you any favors. And everybody's going to find out because there are people who just scour the web looking for stuff like this so they can call you out on it. Um, this is actually the biggest logo of design make of all. And unfortunately, it's becoming more and more common. Um, as mentioned, the purpose of a logo is to represent a business. If it looks the same as someone else's, it's definitely failed in that regard. Copying others does nobody any favors, either the client nor the designer. Yeah. Yes, they are called they are called internet trolls and they are out there looking at your work. <laughs> exactly. I actually once had somebody um rip off a t-shirt design that I did. And this was way back, gosh. This was back in like 2005 and I was selling the t-shirts for like I made like 25 cents a t-shirt on Cafe Press and this person made the same exact t-shirt as me and you could tell when the shops were created and then he 
decided to copyright it and it was like a well-known phrase and then he had cafe press send me a cease and desist order that he came up with at first and i basically had to show cafe press well i made my shop before him my shop's been open for two years and this is kind of ridiculous because I only make like 25 cents a t-shirt, as does he. And Cafe Press was like, oh, all right, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> so it was so crazy, but I was like, how are you going to do that? I'm like, you totally ripped off my idea. And the funny thing is, is I was like, the idea is not actually that clever. Like, that's exactly what I told Cafe Press. I'm like, I really wasn't that clever when I came up with it. It's kind of a well-known phrase. I mean... I kind of used it in a different way, but I'm, I said to him, I'm like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that clever. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I did. I, I had all of my information. I was like, whatever, even if I have to take it down, it's not like, it, you know, I was actively like relying on that for income. It was just something I did for fun, but I was like, oh, get over yourself, guy. So kind of, kind of funny. All right, so let's talk about Paul Rand. Paul Rand is one of my favorite logo designers. He has designed so many iconic logos that are out there, and you'll probably notice a couple of them when I show them to you. Yep, that is one of them. So he, one of his quotes, I have a quote on each page um, from him. Um, on each of the pages about him. So simplicity is not the goal. It is the byproduct of a good idea and modest expectations. So even after his death in 1996, Paul Rand remains one of the most famous graphic designers in the world. Born Peretz Rosenbaum, on August 15th, 1914, he's most renowned for his corporate logos. Rand was educated at the Pratt Institute from 1929 to 1932 in the Art, Insti Art Students League from 1933 to 1934. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I did a whole project on him in school, too. He was one of the originators of the Swiss style of graphic design, which I love the Swiss style of graphic design. Um, can you name a font that came out of that? That style that represents kind of that style? See if you guys know what I'm talking about. It's very, it's a very classic font. And I was thinking of Future. Future came out of like that era. Um, from 1956 to 1969 and beginning again in 1974, Rand taught design at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Rand was inducted into the New York Art Directors Club Hall of Fame in 1972. He designed many posters and corporate identities, including the logos for IBM, UPS, and ABC. Rand um, died of cancer on November 26, 1996, and is buried in Beth L. Cemetery in Norwalk, Connecticut. So, here is his iconic ABC logo, and here's the thing, it was 1962, so he designed everything. We didn't have, you know, Photoshop and Illustrator back then. He designed everything by hand, so stop and think about how just good of a designer he had to be to do this, you know, by hand and get you know, that level of detail and just the symmetry and the math that goes into this, I mean, it's amazing. So another quote from him, should a logo be self-explanatory? It is only by association with a product, a service, a business, or a corporation that a logo takes on any real meaning. It derives its meaning and its usefulness from the quality of that which it symbolizes. If a company is second rate, the logo will eventually be perceived as second rate. It is foolhardy to believe that a logo will do its job immediately before an audience has been properly conditioned. So even though this is an extremely simple logo, think about what televisions were back in the 1960s. It was black and white, and you needed something that was going to stand out on the screen. And this alone would stand out on the screen. ABC, there it is. You know, nothing... And, and also everything was coming over with bunny ears. So you, you had to kind of attest for, you know, interference and things being fuzzy on the screen. So there was all of these, you know, different factors going into, um, you know, making sure that the presentation of this logo always remained clear on a screen, black and white, very bold and very simple. 
And then he designed this logo for IBM in 1962. So a logo does not sell directly, it identifies. And I can't remember if the IBM logo has been redesigned. I need to look. I don't, no, it hasn't, it hasn't. So they are still using, in 2017, the Rand Paul design from 1962. So tell me that that is not a logo that stands the test of time and a design that stands the test of time, that got through the 80s, that got through the 90s, the 2000s, when everything had to have like, you know, a glow on it. It, it's, it really is just a timeless, timeless design. And then he designed the iconic UPS logo with the top, with the shield, and the um, package at the top. I do not use humor consciously. I just go that way naturally. A well-known example is my identity for United Parcel Services. To take in execution, a medieval symbol, which inevitably, inevitably seems pompous today, and then stick a package on top of that, that is funny. Um, however, UPS has redesigned their logo. So let's discuss this redesign. <laughs> Basically, when this redesign came out, it has every single trend that was going on at the time of the redesign, and it is dated. We have a swoosh happening. We have a bevel and emboss. We have an outer glow. We have a gradient. <laughs> there is so much going on in this logo from something that was so simple to this. Do you know that when we were sent these logos back in 2003, when this was redesigned, we could not get a vector version of the logo. So it looks awful in grayscale. We, they ended up having to send out a second version. And here's the thing, like I worked and I did direct mail back then. And I also worked, or did I work at the newspaper? I worked at the newspaper at the beginning part of 2003. And then I worked doing direct mail at the end of 2003. And UPS was very, very particular on their corporate identity. So what that meant was, is they sent you templates and you had to use those templates and you had to input the information, you know, for the different stores into certain parts. They were extremely um, rigid with their corporate identity. So all of a sudden they upgrade their logo or update their logo and they send it out to us and they sent us a JPEG, a PNG, and then... Gosh, I don't even know what the other file was. It was like an SVF file or something. It was like something from like um, a program that doesn't even exist anymore. And we were like, okay, that's great, but we're in print. So we need a vector version of your logo because the sizes that you sent us are smaller than it's going, than it's going to run on the pieces that you need. So we need the vector version. Can you send us the EPS or can you send us an Illustrator file? And their response was, we do not have a vector version of this logo. Do you want to know how much UPS spent on the redesign of this logo? And they did not have a vector version. $20 million. How crazy is that? <laughs> they spent $20 million to have their logo redesigned and the designers, yeah, I, that's what I said. I was like, I would have done it for five. <laughs> um, and their designers never provided UPS with a vector version of this logo. And you want to know why? Because the logo has a gradient in it. The logo has a bevel and emboss in it. The logo has an outer glow in it. And it has a drop shadow, an inner drop shadow even, in it. So there was no way to make this as a vector version. Somebody had to go in and create all of this as line work. And they did not, yeah, exactly. And they did not come out with a vector version of this logo until 
I think it was a couple of years later. And we were seriously like, are you kidding? Number one, you redesigned Paul Rand's iconic logo. Like, don't even get me started there. But number two, you didn't even follow the basic rules of logo design here. It was just, it was so crazy. And um, they sent out, and I have a copy of it here, they sent out a media kit where it's like they knew that they were going to get backlash on this. <laughs> so they had to write up 29 pages of why they redesigned their logo and about their corporate identity. And it's kind of funny. Um, so their whole idea um, was, oh, where is it? Was because they don't accept packages anymore with a bow tie. It was at least CMYK. I do. You know what? Hold on. I might be lying. It was, it had spot colors. So when you made it CMYK, it didn't look right. It, it was just, it was so laughable. And um, it, yeah, it, it, I don't even think it was, it was something like it had like, it was like CMYK, but then it had like four spot colors. So you couldn't like, you, you couldn't separate it out correctly when we sent it to press. It was a nightmare. We were like, oh, and this part doesn't work either. And so we told them, I said, you've got to call UPS and you got to tell them like, hey, you know, we can't meet their own corporate standards based on the artwork they sent us. And that was some funny phone calls I had to make. I was one of the people who had to make those phone calls. And it was hysterical. Um, so yeah, the reason behind it was that they no longer accepted packages that were tied in string. So therefore they felt that the logo needed to be redesigned. Um, oh, here it is. I knew that they talked about it. The most visible change to the UPS logo is the removal of the bow tied parcel that appears atop the shield. Ironically, even though the small bow had become one of the most recognized features of the company's logo, packages with string have not been accepted by UPS for several decades because the string can get caught in high speed sorting machines. The logo now being replaced was designed in 1961 by Paul Rand, a renowned brand designer who was also responsible for the logos of IBM, ABC, Westinghouse, and Yale University, among others. So they're like, we know that we shouldn't be redesigning this. Um, exactly. You aren't redesigning the package itself. And then even they said it, they're like, we got rid of the part of our logo that was the most recognized feature. They literally said that. Like what's, you know, what is the most recognized part, uh, feature of the Starbucks logo? It's the mermaid. You know, the mermaid has kind of evolved over time and then they've lost the name Starbucks because they know that the most recognizable name feature of their logo is the mermaid. They didn't lose the mermaid from the logo and just go with something else. So it's like they literally just decided to throw caution to the wind and get rid of all the rules for a logo redesign. Um, and I think on here, it might tell you how to use the logo. Let me see, because that'll be kind of funny if it does. Um, I'm wondering if this got into that. I just want to. And people all over the world lost their collective minds when UPS redesigned this logo. There were so many articles on it. Um, I just remember just reading them and laughing. But I wanted to see if they showed, told you how to use the logo on here. And it might have just been something that was sent out to us. Um, oh, and the company that did it was called Teddy Crafters, apparently. No. Oh, this is something else. Never mind. Um, no, they don't give a, how, uh, UPS brand specifications. Oh, they do have trademark guidelines. Oh, here it is. Um, they might have changed it. Um, oh no, it doesn't, it was so funny. Like it showed you like it needed to print in this 
this color. It needs to be this. This needs to be this. Oh, here it is. Like the, oh, that's the layout for their store. But it's, you know, they were super specific and it was, that's why it was even more hysterical was they were just so specific and they couldn't even provide you with, you know, the items that you needed in order to make this work. Um, right. You're right. Um, going back to the Starbucks logo. So I'm going to pull up, um, Starbucks logo evolution. So you can see. Another great one to look at as far as the evolution is, um, so here was the first one. Starbucks coffee, tea, and spices because they're new. Nobody knew who they were, but it still had that mermaid. Um, and then they went to, um, they added kind of like an espresso thing, apparently. I don't recall seeing this at all. Um, but you can tell that the original logo was still the inspiration for this other logo that only went on one product, it looks like. Then they went to just Starbucks coffee, still the mermaid, and she had the two, um, I don't know, are they fins, I guess? Then the mermaid got a little bit bigger zoomed in um and now it's just the mermaid which again you're right the mermaid has absolutely nothing to do with starbucks or coffee or anything but it's so iconic yeah it used to be a naked mermaid yes um it's so iconic that they stuck with it um another good logo evolution is the apple logo the very first version of the Apple logo is the epitome of, oh my God, this is way too much. Um, which is so funny when you um, think about, uh, you know, just how simplistic Apple's design is now. Like, let me pull up a bigger version because this is really hard to see. Original. Can't type tonight. And here it is. This is the very first Apple logo. So it was Sir Isaac Newton sitting under a tree thinking, and I think it had an apple that was like falling on his head. Maybe this will be a better. Oh. Oh, I lost you guys. Sorry, I'm back. Hold on. Is everybody still here? Just on purpose. Oh, all right. There, all right. <laughs> I was like, whoa. I'm like, the, the internet's not. It, it slowed down really quick. And then I'm like, oh, no, I'm gone. All right, I'm back. Whew. The people who are watching at home, I think it just continues to record, so they're going to be like, what is she talking about? All right, so here's the original Apple computer logo. Look at how much detail is in this logo. I mean, compared to what we know now for the Apple logo. Th this is just way too much for a logo. I mean, you've got Apple Computer Company. Okay, there is this whole illustration of Newton sitting under a tree with an apple. There's a whole mountainside in the background, uh, the sky with puffy clouds, and then you have Newton, a mind forever voyaging through blah, 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 blah. What is going on here? Way too much for a logo. Way too much. Um, so after that, they went to the um, edible apple, which was the rainbow apple, and they had that for years, years and years. Oh, here we go. I was going to say, I'm they had that from 19, so they only had this logo for one year, 1976 to 1977. And then from 1977 to 1998, you know, um, they had the uh, Rebo logo. And then in 1998, they went to the all black Apple logo, which you do still see from time to time, because you see that when they have a black and white version. 2001, they got really stylized. And this actually looks like the um, old G4 towers that they used to have. 
Um, hold on, Apple G4 Tower. Because I used to, we used to have one over right here. So this is what the Apple G4 Tower used to look like, which you can see kind of resembles that logo. And then they changed the G4 Towers to this, which randomly enough, or looks a little bit like that logo. So you can see that they were at least, you know, in the swoosh, they have the swoosh. Now they're just back to the simplistic apple, but it's, it's gray instead of being all black. So, you know, they've started to simplify their design and their design, you know, their website really shows, you know, it, very simple design, um, you know, just very simple. Even though there's a lot going on, very simple design. All right, so let's get back into Illustrator. I'm gonna keep working a little bit on those logos that I was working on, because I think it's kind of good for people to, to see, you know, some, some work being done in Illustrator, kind of gives you an idea of what to do. Also, um, you know, some tips and tricks that I can show you on the way. So let me find my logo. Ah, there it is, okay. So this is where I had left off on um, Monday, was I was sketching in Illustrator, and I said, you can sketch in Illustrator, you can sketch in Photoshop, you can sketch on a piece of paper, just take, you know, make sure it's, it looks professional, um, take a picture of it or scan your paper in, and again, make sure those pictures look professional, and that's fine, as long as it looks professional, as long as it looks like something that you would submit to a client. In these classes, I am your teacher, but I'm also your client. So you really want to teach me, you really want to treat me like a client. You know, I want you to present things to me the same way that you would present them to a client. I have the same exact expectations. So let's say that I want to, um, maybe work on this one and kind of, get a good solid design on this one and a good solid design on this one, let's say. Like those are the two I'm gonna pick that I'm gonna refine. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy what I have out of this um, document and make a new document. And I'm just gonna start with one artboard. And, oh, let me change my, my art, but it's a little bit small. Do, 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 artboard. Yeah. I would like you, hold on. Oh. Where is artboard options? There we go. I'll say, where are my options with 10 by 10? Okay, and drag you down there. So what I had started to do was I started to put this wave over um, the words and I wanted it to look like the oceans, kind of like, like Martha's Vineyards in the ocean. And very quickly what I started to do was, you know, because this was just a sketch, was I used the brush tool and I just kind of colored with white over um, that version of the logo. But you can see, like, if I was to place this on something, obviously that's not going to work, so I really need to refine this. So I need to get rid of, basically, those um, white um, brush strokes that I did. So I'm just going to uh, select object. I'm just gonna lock what I don't wanna delete and then select everything else and hit delete. So, whoops, nope, that wasn't what I wanted to do.
M A R T H. A. Oh yeah. Thought these would. Where is? I feel like I have a. text version underneath there, but it doesn't look it. What is going on here? U, U, command two. All right. Now delete. There we go. All right. And you can stay there, but I am going to edit. Unlock all of these objects and lock you in the background. All right, there we go. So this wave, I like this wave, but it's kind of running off of the M right here. So I want to make sure that it's right to the edge of the M. So I'm going to move that over and see what's going on on this side. This is running a little bit off the edge, too. So let me turn on my rulers. There we go. And I'll drop a rule over here, too. Using rulers is the best way to do things, so that way you, you know you have everything nice and lined up. And I sometimes like to, to work in outline mode. So that's um, view, outline, or command Y. I just find it easier to kind of look at my line work that way. So, you know, just a little, tri uh, little tip for anybody else if, that's, if that helps you out. And then I want to lock my guides. Or lock my rulers, I should say. Guides, lock guides, there we go, all right. Perfect. So I want this edge of the wave to come down to both of these letters. So I wanna get it, I wanna zoom way in. And you may think it's crazy that I'm getting this detailed, but think about, you know, think if my logo is really big, you know, little minute details like this are gonna look huge if I put this on a on a billboard. So I really need to, you know, kind of be on point here with what I'm doing. And that includes getting that guide. Oh. Correct. There we go. Guides. Unlock guides. There we go. Get okay, right to the edge. Probably do the same thing. Check over here. Well, I have them unlocked. There we go. And lock them again. All right. So again, you really need to be that particular when you are creating a logo. I mean, think of how particular um, Paul Rand was with the ABC logo, drawing it by hand. Yeah, you know, each, like, let me, um, let me pull that back up just so I can kind of show you. You know, the measurements between like this part of the A and this part of the A and this part of the A, like he, it was, it's all equal, you know? It's, it's perfectly drawn. And this is actually, I believe, Bauhaus font, which he might have had a hand in designing. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I feel like he may have. I'm gonna move my V over. And also down to this edge. There we go, which means I gotta edit these letters. Drop another rule.
Oh, I might not be able to get it exact. All right, that's as close as I can get it. Phew. Lost those again. And move these other letters down. Might be able to just use the align tool for this. Let's see. They'll line them up correctly. Ah, perfect. All right. So I've started to get everything where it needs to go. I need to fix this edge. My wave, I'm not 100% happy with that. And I'm going to make a copy of this wave and bring it down here. Because what I want to do is I want to remove the top parts of these letters and the bottom parts of these letters. So it looks like that the negative space would then create the wave. That's my goal with this one, except for right here, this one, I'm gonna bring just down over the D. Bring it off of the R a little bit. I'm going to edit this one just a little bit. So I need to use my Pathfinder to do this. And let me, let me take a look at this too. I want this part of the A's wave to go around this part of the A. So I need to fix this. There we go. And that looks good. It's getting a little bit confusing, but. All right, so I'm gonna pull up my Pathfinder tool. I might have it open. Nope, uh, yep, I did. And, all right, let me think of the best way to do this. Sometimes things go weird in the Pathfinder tool, I have found. So what I like to do, just in case, is make a copy of everything I'm about to cut and move it off. <laughs> so that way, just in case if it gets a little bit odd. All right, let's see if we can group these first into one shape. And then let's see if we can do this one and cut them all up. Perfect. That should work. So you'll, if you want to use the Pathfinder, it's kind of different for everybody based on whatever it is that you're doing. There's no one real way for the Pathfinder tool to kind of work sometimes. It's, it can end up being a little bit of a crapshoot, I'm not gonna lie. Um, Mm, yeah, I'll get rid of that. You can still tell it's an A. And even though I'm doing this, I need to make sure that there's enough of each letter where I can still tell 
what the word is. You know, if I delete too much of the letter, then I can't tell that it spells Martha's Vineyard. So it's kind of a delicate balance doing this. It's also a little bit monotonous. <laughs> All right, perfect. And then I'm gonna do the same exact thing down here. I'm gonna grab all of these letters first, and I'm gonna combine them. This is the combine, the one that where it shows the two boxes without any difference. So that makes them like one object basically. And then I select that and the wave. Sure, I got the whole wave. And I do um, this one, which basically cuts everything into sections. And then I have to delete with the white arrow, not the black arrow tool. And this is why I put that um, colored background behind it so I can kind of, I can see a little bit better what I'm doing. It's not really part of the design at all. It's just so that way I can see what's going on. And you can see how now I have that wave. So, I mean, I can even move this up closer. And move this down to be in line and kind of take care of that space in here. So there's one version of my logo, which you can see it definitely works in black and white, whether it's on a colored background or not. And it's kind of got like, you know, it's kind of got a beachy theme to it. Um, so I, I feel like that's a good representation for the island. Um, you know, I, letting people know, hey, it's a beach, like there's water, there's the ocean there. So I, I think that this would probably work. So when I am um, creating, let me unlock everything. So when I am submitting this one, what I would do is get rid of all this extra stuff everywhere and make sure I have a nice presentation of it, probably group everything and have it nice and centered on the page. So what I like to do, I use rectangles or, or squares for like everything. Um, color palette. So I'll draw a square in the background and then I'll just align everything to that square. And then delete it out. You know, just to make sure everything's nice and lined up. Take a look at it, make sure it looks good. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that. So that would be one version of um, my, my more finished piece. Um, I don't remember how we were supposed to save things, so let me just look that up. I think it's like part two or something. Um, minimum of nine sketches, nine preliminary, and then three um, in 
refined black and white versions. So you have to put everything together. Okay, in a multi-page PDF. All right, so I would save this as um, refined number one. And what I do is I put everything in a folder. So this is refined number one as an Illustrator file. These are my sketches. So I would name these, you know, live session is fine because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, you can do nine artboards. Um, yes, you could do nine artboards. Um, I, I personally, and this is a preference, I don't like working in artboard, artboards. Um, I think it's just because as far as I'm concerned, artboards are kind of a newer thing that Adobe started doing. I mean, at this point, it's probably been 10 years. <laughs> but, um, but to me, it feels new because I've been in Adobe for so long. So I'm used to working in just one document at a time. A lot of people love working in artboards. I just happen to not be one of those people. So what I tend to do is I work in different documents, but if you did um, nine artboards, then you would have a multi-page PDF when you save it as a PDF. So that would probably be your easiest way to go. If you wanted to do it this way, um, I'll show you. You can do a save as a copy PDF, and then you would save this as a copy PDF. So even with nine artboards, it'll still save as multi-page PDF? It should. I'm going to double check that right now because this one I have four artboards and I'm 99.9% .9 yes, and that will save. Yep, it's a multi-page PDF but with the four. But let's say that like you have, this will probably help you. Let's say you have one in the Illustrator document that has all of your sketches and then you have other Illustrator documents that have your more refined sketches. And so you have two different files. Save them both as a PDF, and you can go into um, Acrobat and do File, Create, PDF from, well, combine files into a single PDF. And all you have to do is literally drop them and put them in the order. So you can put them you know, first and then second, click Combine. And now I have, it'll automatically name it binder. So you'll just need to name it with the naming convention of DES 242 assignment one, first last PDF. So you can do file, save as. I don't know where you're trying to put that. Not there. Mod 11. And I like to be super, I don't know if you can tell, super organized with my files. I can tell you pretty much where anything is because I save things the same way every single mod. And there's my multi-page PDF. And if it puts it in the wrong order, you can edit the PD, oh, whoops, that's not it. Hold on, not edit. Organize pages. And you can drag and put things where, they, where they're supposed to go. Oh, that wasn't the right order, because that was my first sketch. Second sketch, third sketch, fourth, and then finished ones. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I would set it up. Um, personally, if you, you know, it's just a couple of different options. But again, if you wanted to keep working in this one file, you can just, I think, keep adding artboards to this. Um, by going to document setup, edit artboards, shift click to select multiple artboards, artboard options. Artboards. Custom, blah, blah, blah. You can do it on the same panel as the layers too. Oh, all right, yeah. Like I said, I almost never work in artboards, so I'm always like, hold on, where's my layers, layers, layers? Oh, oh, goodness. Illustrator, layer one. It's not by adding extra layers though. Hold on. Nope. Go down to the bottom and it'll say add a new layer. Yeah, but the layers, a layer is a layer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a new artboard, I'm sorry. It does give you a new artboard? Is that what this one is? 
Um, for some reason, mine has a an artboard icon. It yeah, it, it mine used to too, and I'm wondering if this is new. If I've hit that magical thing that's different in 2018 right now. Nope, that didn't add an artboard. Oh, Illustrator. I'm going to have to probably look that up. And there used to be like an option. Of, wait a minute. What's going on up here? Essentials classic. <laughs> artboards. Edit artboards. It used to be up here. I feel like I'm not getting any of my options when I hover either. Rearrange. All right, I can look this up because I know I'm just like having a total and complete brain meltdown right now. I'll, I will look that up um, for you guys. Adding an artboard in 2018. Okay, the, 2018 also gives you these like icons, like they're being helpful and they're actually not. <laughs> Um, I feel like it's like super, super easy and I'm just like missing it here. Hold on. <sighs> yeah, mine has uh, the layers and then right next to layers, the tabs. Yeah. But I don't see it on yours. Yeah, it, this is, this is new. And then I messed up. Um, Try the layout. Um, tab where it says Essentials Classic, try the layout. I'm in, the, yeah, I'm in Essentials Classic. Oh, try layout. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. See if I get different options. There it is. Right to the left. See, it says Artboards to the left of Layers up there at the top. Yes. Right oh, all right, yeah, okay. That, that's weird. All right, so be in if you're in 2018, thank you. Be in layout. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> and of course, it's like I said, it's one of those things where I'm like, and of course, I never use artboard. So six, seven, eight, nine, and then you could add in the other three. So you could have 12 artboards right there, and um, basically put everything together. And I think that you can then change the layout of your artboards as well. Um, I had that, I, sh I saw that somewhere when I was trying to do something else. But yeah, so. Um, you can just drag them just like you do with the layers. Yeah, well. I mean, yeah, the artboards, you can just drag them up and down. Sure. Yeah, you can drag them up and down. I, I meant like you can like see how it, it was up and down. It it changed the. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and right. I saw like an option to fix that, and now I don't know where it is. And it, honestly, in the long run, it almost doesn't matter because you're going to be zooming in and working on one at a time, and it, it's still going to set them up exactly the same way. Um, if you do run into something where when you make the multi-page PDF and let's say like some of your artboards, like your things kind of got a little bit out of order, um, you can edit that by going in and organizing your pages. And if you don't see the option for organized pages over here, all you need to do is go with the search, organize, start typing in organize, and it will bring that up. And you can just drag and drop right in your PDF where you need the pages to go and then hit save. So that's a really good option. The other thing I would say is in, if you do this in Photoshop or you do this in Illustrator, your finals need to be done in Illustrator. Your final revised versions of it need to be done in Illustrator. But let's say that, you created um, your sketches in Photoshop. That's where doing the two PDFs will come in um, and you can combine those PDFs like I showed you before. But also just note on your artboard, it can be really small down at the bottom. Just put like sketch one, you know, so I know which ones are sketches. Like if you get over here and I see three and I'm like, well, these are three, versions like you know 
do sketch two, sketch three, sketch four. And then when you get to your refined version, say refine number one, refine number two, refine number three. That'll just make it easier on my end to know what it is that I'm looking at. Um, so I would really appreciate that if you guys could do that. Um, so yeah, I would just put it nice and small. You just want it really small in the corner so it's not distracting from your design. But um, so that way you can, you know, really, you know. Okay, I'm a, I'm a little confused. Okay. Uh, help me out here. Okay. What is the number of all these boards that we're doing? Cause I heard a nine somewhere, and then I heard five, and then I heard four. Can um, you please nine. explain? Yep, it, you need to have nine sketches um, of your redesigns. So let's say that you chose to do your redesigns in Illustrator. You know, to sketch in Illustrator, kind of like what I did. You would have nine different artboards for your nine different sketches. But then after you do that, you need to choose three of the most promising ones and create a refined black and white version of that logo. Oh, okay. Yep, okay. so then that would be your Artboard 10, Artboard 11, Artboard 12. Ultimately, you need to have a 12-page PDF that you're submitting because there should be nine sketches and then there should be, um, three refined versions. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you a couple of different ways you can do this. Cause I know like people are doing a couple of different things. And so they might get a little bit confused. Let's say you did your sketches in Photoshop because to you, that just, that just made a little bit more sense. That's completely fine. Um, or you sketched your, um, that you sketched them out on paper and then you took pictures of them and you brought those pictures into Photoshop. Cause either way you would probably end up in Photoshop, either of those directions. So let's say that you have, I'm just going to make a small document right now. Like you would have a definitely a bigger document. I'm just doing this to create something. Um, let's say that you had, um, you did one sketch, this one, we'll pretend you did it in Photoshop. So you have that there. Um, and you have another sketch that you took a picture of and you're opening it up. So let me just open up a picture real quick. <laughs> so I can just kind of show you a couple of different examples. Um, here's a picture that you, you took of your other sketch. And then you decided, you know what, I am gonna use Photoshop for the rest of them. So I'm going to do something with um, artboards. 800 by 800 by, it doesn't even matter. Um, why aren't you giving me the option create? And not to cut you off while you're talking about that. Um, okay. how, what's the size these artboards are supposed to be? Um, I usually do. Cause I did five by five. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. You know, that's a good size. Sometimes I like to work bigger. Sometimes I do 10 by 10, but five by five is five is definitely fine. Yep. That that's completely fine. Um, so let's say that you did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine. So between these three documents, you have nine logos on them. I'm just going to put like nine things basically on these. So I can kind of show you an example of how you would set this up. I'm going to put a YouTube logo there. Um, 
put a Facebook logo here. And this is just, just so that way I can show you how to set up these, um, these PDF files, because I know that can get a little bit confusing. Um, this one, I'll just put this. Um, this one gets this. I don't even know what I'm dragging here. And this one gets this background. Okay. And then I have an image and I have this other one that I sketched up. So I've got three different files going here with all these different artboards. And how do I combine them all, basically? So I'm going to do a file save as on the first one. And I'm going to make sure that I put all of these into a folder so I don't get confused. And I'm going to, so I'm going to make a folder called, you know, just multiple PDFs. And I'm going to save one as a Photoshop PDF. I'm just going to name it one. Save PDF. I'm going to do the next one, save as, put it in the same folder, save it as a PDF. And I'll name it two, just so I, things are in order, save PDF. Then I get to this one that has multiple artboards. So I'm gonna do a file, save as, whoops, hold on. Export, sorry, file export artboards to PDF and I want to do a multi-page PDF document and I'm going to click run oh specify my destination put it in that same folder run Okay, I'll double check that one. So I should have three PDF files. One has multiple pages already in it. One has one, the other has the other. Together they make nine files from my Photoshop, you know, my Photoshop, um, mock-ups that I've done. But I know that I need to create my three final refined versions in Illustrator. So I can just right off the bat make a new file with three artboards just to make it easy. One, two, three. Create and do my refined version. So here's refined version number one. Um, Let's say this is refined version number two. And I'll go with I'll go with this one so I can tell the difference. This is refined version number three. So again, I'm going to do a file, save as. Put it in that same folder, multiple PDFs. I'll just name this one five or something. PDF, save, save PDF. So now I have all of these different files and I know I need to submit just one file, you know, for my submission. So I'm gonna go into, where am I here? Acrobat. I'm gonna do a file, create. I wanna um, combine files into a single PDF because I got all these files here. So I'm gonna grab one, two, and then that untitled one, because those are all my sketches, I'm gonna grab those ones first and drag them in. Then I'm gonna drag that last one in. It's probably gonna take a minute. Don't crash on me now.
Oh, please don't crash. I can't tell if it's like I just did too much or if uh, Acrobat hates me. That might have been more than I could handle. Hold on. Combine. Where are you? Create PDF. Combine files. All right, let's try that one more time. I'll drag them one at a time. One. Where is it putting them? These aren't even that big. <laughs> Add files, all right, two, oh, there we go, all right. Should have gave me the option to see this, it's not working. Let me quit out, I think I killed my acrobat. File. Create, it literally just did this. Combine files into a single PDF. Add files. There we go, all right. Whew. So I'm gonna put these in order. So this one has my last three, my, my three that are um, finished. These are my ones, my sketches, and then my last three. I'm just, so I'm gonna kinda, put everything in order because your refined sketches should be at the end. I'll just hit combine. Now I have a 12 page PDF. I'm sorry that that was like super confusing because Acrobat was not doing what it was supposed to at the beginning. So I can see your sketch number one. I can see your sketch number two. I can see sketch number three. I can see sketch number four. I can see set sketch number five, sketch number six, sketch number seven eight, nine, and then I get your first refi refined version, your second refined version, your third refined version. Does that make more sense or did I confuse you even more by showing you this? It kind of is difficult because it's like whatever anybody does, whichever way anybody created their files originally, there's like 10 different ways you could end up at the, the, same, the same process at the end. Does that make a little bit more sense though? Um, just a little bit, but I, I, I think I can make it. Okay, yeah, it, the ultimate goal is that 12-page PDF at the end. You know, that's, that's the ultimate goal. So whatever way ends up being the easiest, if it's easier for you to bring kind of everything into Illustrator and be like, you know what, I'm just going to make one new file that has 12 artboards and put everything on there, that's fine and make a PDF. If, uh, if it's easier for you to combine multiple PDFs together, that's fine as well. Hey, even if you wanna make an InDesign file, a 12 page InDesign file and place everything in InDesign and then make a PDF, that's fine. I don't, I don't really care how you end up at the 12 page PDF as long as you're submitting that. I'm, I'm not going to be picky as long as, you know, the, the last three logos are vector and um, you know you've submitted one multi-page PDF that makes that has everything um, everything in it. Okay, now I can sketch using my Wacom, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome that you have that at your disposal. Um, yeah, I I would I would. That that okay. sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still learning how to use it. But yeah, I, I can you know, use it good enough to kind of sketch out some oh, things. Oh, nice, nice, no. yeah. Um, I, never, I never got the hang of it. It's like I, I kept wanting it to do things that it, it's not meant to do, basically, and I'm like, I just want to draw like a pencil. <laughs> but no, if you have that, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely use that. Um, is there anything else I can go over before we end tonight? I'm good, not with me. Okay. Yeah, I'm good, I understand everything crystal clear. All right, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm super excited to see all of your logo design, so I can't wait until everybody uploads everything so I can have a look. And again, if you're running into any trouble this week, um, make sure that you're emailing me um, or getting in with the learning coaches. Also, if you think that you're going to need a little bit more time, make sure that you um, email me sooner rather than later. And, um, um, you know, 
I can work with you there. But um, thanks for coming, you guys. Um, and I hope to see um, I hope to see you next week. And again, you know, just get back in and do the rest of the discussion for this week and work on um, your assignment and your assessment. We should be good. All right. Okay. Good night. Have a good night. Night.